I'm going to talk about the reasons why we're here to some extent and then uh, what I'm doing about it. So the reason why we're here is, uh, in some sense, the extrapolation of the talk that we just heard, that progress is occurring, uh, is occurring at a rapidly increasing rate. And uh, absent some other disaster uh, that we could bring upon ourselves, uh, I think we have to make the prudent assumption that AI systems will be able to make decisions uh, in a broad sense better than we can. Uh, and what that really means is that they're using more information than we can uh, individually take into account in making a decision, and they will be able to look further ahead into the future. And so just as uh, AlphaGo could beat any of us uh, at playing Go, you take the Go board and you expand it out uh, to the world, uh, then we are going to be dealing with superior uh, decision-making capabilities from machines. And uh, this is potentially an incredibly good thing because everything we have, <clears throat> everything that's worthwhile about our civilization comes from our uh, intelligence. And so if we have access to significantly greater sources of intelligence that we can use, uh, then this will inevitably be uh, a step change in our civilization. And uh, of course, with any such uh, powerful technology, we expect there to be some downsides. Um, the possibility of using this in, uh, in military uh, sphere has been raised and is already occurring, um, but I'm not gonna talk about that. There are sessions later on. Um, Eric talked about the question of employment. This is another big theme of the conference. Uh, I'd like to talk about this one, uh, the, the possible end of the human race. Uh, that's a very uh, lurid way to describe it, and fortunately the press are not here, uh, or at least if they are here, they have to keep quiet. So um, why? Why are people talking about this, right? What's wrong with taking a technology that has all kinds of beneficial uses and making it better? Uh, what's, what's the problem? And um, you can go back to uh, a speech um, given a little while ago, if a machine can think, it might think more intelligently and, than we do, and then where should we be? Uh, even if we could keep the machines in a subservient position, for instance, by turning off the power, I've, I've uh, highlighted turning off the power because we'll get to that answer later on. Uh, at strategic moments, we should, as a species, be greatly humbled. Uh, and this new danger is certainly something that, that should give us anxiety. Uh, so this was actually a speech of Alan Turing in 1951 uh, given on BBC Radio 3, uh, as we now call it. Um, so it's a very inchoate fear, right? There's no real specification of why uh, this could be a problem, just this sort of general unease that making something more intelligent than you uh, could humble your species. And the gorillas, uh, here they are having a meeting to discuss, this is their version of our meeting, and they ha they're having this discussion. And they say, look, yeah, you're right. You know, our ancestors made these humans a few million years ago, and you know, we had these inchoate fears then, and they turned out to be true. Our species is humbled, right? Um, but we can actually be more specific than that. So here's another quote. If we use to achieve our uh, purposes a mechanical agency with whose operation we cannot interfere effectively, we better be quite sure that the purpose put into the machine is the purpose which we really desire. So here's a more specific reason why there's a problem, that you will put some objective uh, and the machine will carry it out and it turns out not to be the right one. And this is from a paper by Norbert Wiener in 1960, uh, written actually in response to, to the work by Arthur Samuel showing that uh, his checker playing program could learn to play checkers uh, much better than he could. Uh, but this could equally have been King Midas uh, talking you know, 2,500 years ago uh, realizing that uh, when you get exactly what you say you want, it's often not what you really want, uh, and it's sometimes too late. So this is sometimes called the value misalignment problem, that AI systems will be incredibly good at achieving an objective which turns out not to be what we really want. And uh, so if you said, okay, great, well, you know, let's look at everything we know about how to, uh, how to design the objectives to avoid this problem, Unfortunately, you find that there really isn't very much to go on. That all of these fields that, that are based on this idea of optimizing objectives, which is not just AI, but economics and statistics and operations research and control theory, 
they all have the same problem. They assume that the objective is just something that someone else brings along to the game, uh, and then the game is that we optimize the objective. And you know, economists certainly notice that things like profit and GDP, uh, which are the sort of the official objectives, turn out not to be always the things that we really want to be optimizing, but they haven't really figured out what to do instead. Um, and then uh, Steve Omohundro and others pointed out that there's a, yet another problem, which is that uh, whatever objective you give to a machine, uh, it will need to stay alive in order to achieve it. Uh, and so there's, if there's a little takeaway from the talk, it's you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead. Right, so if you ask the machine to fetch the coffee, staying alive is a sub-goal of fetching the coffee. And if you, um, uh, if you interfere with the machine in its attempt to get the coffee, it will prevent you from interfering. If you try to turn it off, uh, it will take countermeasures to being turned off because its objective is to get the coffee. Um, so if you combine that with value misalignment, now you have a system that has an objective that you don't like because you specified it wrong, and now it's defending itself against any attempts to, uh, to switch it off or to change what it's doing. Um, then you get the problem that you know, science fiction has talked about. It's not uh, spontaneous evil consciousness where the machine wakes up and hates humans. Uh, it's just this combination of uh, unfortunate circumstances uh, that arise from having a very, very powerful technology. Okay, so lots of people have said, well, you know, this is all rubbish, all right? Everything I've said is, is complete nonsense, uh, and um, one of the first responses, in fact, there are many responses. Uh, I've written a paper where I list about 15 of these, uh, of these responses, um, and I think they're all kind of defensive knee-jerk reactions that haven't been thought through. So you find, for example, people in the AI community saying, having said for 60 years, of course we will get to human level AI, despite what all those skeptics from the philosophy community and everything, all those other people don't know what they're talking about, of course we'll get to human level AI. And as soon as you point out that that's a problem, they say, well, of course we'll never get to human level AI. Um, but I just want to point out that in, you know, in history, there have been these uh, occasions where other powerful technologies uh, have been stated to be impossible. Uh, so here's Ernest Rutherford on September 11, 1933, uh, he gave a speech in Leicester uh, addressing the British Association for the Advancement of Science, and he said that uh, essentially there's no chance that we'll ever be able to extract energy from atoms. They knew the energy was in there, they could calculate how much, um, but they said there's no possibility we'll ever be able to get it out. And, and even Einstein uh, was extremely doubtful that we would ever be able to get anything out of, uh, out of the atom. Uh, and then the next morning, uh, Leo Zillard read about this speech in the Times and went for a walk and invented the neutron-induced nuclear chain reaction. <laughs> so, uh, so there, there's, there's only been like a few of these giant te technological uh, step changes uh, in our history, and, and this one took 16 hours. So, uh, so to say that you know maybe this is the fifth or sixth one that we're talking about. To say that it's never going to happen and to be completely confident that we therefore need to take no precautionary measures whatsoever uh, seems a little rash. Um, okay, so there's lots of other arguments. I'm not going to go through them all. Uh, I'll just, just uh, page through them. I did want to mention the last one, um, the last one which is it's very pernicious, which is, I'm sorry it doesn't show, show up very well, but don't mention the risks. It might be bad for funding. Um, so I've seen this now quite frequently uh, in recent years, and, and if you just look at what happened with nuclear power, I go back to the 50s and 60s where they were trying to gain acceptance for nuclear power, there was every attempt to play down all possible risks, to say it's completely safe, it'll be you know, too cheap to meter, the electricity will be free, there's no pollution, there's no possibility of, of there ever being an accident, uh, and what that leads to is a, a lack of attention to the risks, uh, which then leads to Chernobyl, uh, which then destroys the entire nuclear industry. So history shows it's exactly the other way around, that if you suppress the risks, you will destroy technological progress uh, because then the risk will come to pass. Okay, so I hope that you are now convinced uh, that there is a problem. Um, and so what are we gonna do about it? Because that's the other thing, right? Okay, yes, I agree with you. This is the George Bush uh, response. Okay, yeah, global warming is gonna happen, but it's too late to do anything about it. Um, now, what are we gonna do about this? 
so um, the, uh, the work I'm going to talk about now is, is, is happening under uh, a new center that um, Max mentioned, the Center for Human Compatible AI at Berkeley, which is funded by the Open Philanthropy Project. Uh, and what we're basically trying to do is to change the way that we think about AI uh, away from this notion of pure intelligence, the, the pure optimizer that can take any objective you like uh, and just optimize it, uh, and actually look at uh, a more comprehensive kind of system which is guaranteed to be beneficial uh, to the user in some sense. Um, there's a lot of other work that I I'm not, don't have time to talk about. Uh, many of these new centers and also the professional societies have started to become very interested in these problems uh, as well as the funding agencies uh, and industry. So um, the work at the center is based on three simple ideas. So first of all, that the robot's only objective should be uh, to maximize the realization of human values. And the second point is the robot doesn't know what those are. But nonetheless, its objective is to do this. Um, so these two points together, it turns out, uh, actually make a significant difference to how we design uh, AI systems and the properties that they have. Um, so obviously, if the robot has no idea about what human values are and never discovers what they are, that's not going to be very useful to us. Uh, so it has to have some means of learning. And the best source of information about uh, human values is human behavior, that the standard idea, go, uh, uh, long-standing idea in economics, for example, that our actions reveal our preferences. Uh, and this allows for a process that results in value alignment. Um, and Joshua mentioned on one of his slides uh, a fairly old idea, 20 years old now, inverse reinforcement learning, which is the opposite of reinforcement learning, or the dual so in reinforcement learning, uh, we provide a reward signal and the system has to figure out how to behave. In inverse reinforcement learning, we provide uh, the behavior. In other words, the machine sees our behavior and has to figure out what is the reward function that's being optimized by this behavior. So in economics, this is known as uh, structural estimation of MDPs, which is a somewhat of a mouthful. Um, in control theory, inverse optimal control. Um, so it's a fairly, it's an idea that sprung up independently in several different disciplines. And um, there's now a fairly well uh, advanced theory, lots and lots of papers, demonstrations that this technique can be successful in learning lots of different kinds of behaviors. So it isn't quite what we want. Uh, for one thing, we don't want the robot to, uh, to learn our value function and adopt it. So if it sees me uh, drinking coffee, I don't want the robot to want coffee uh, because that's not, the, that's not the right thing that we want to happen. We want the robot to know that I want coffee and to have the objective of getting me coffee, uh, whatever it might be. So uh, a slight generalization is cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, which is, which is a two-player game. In general, it'll be a, there'll be many humans and many robots, but to start with, one human and one robot. And the human, in some sense, knows their own value function, but only in that they can act approximately according to it. Doesn't mean they can explicate it and write it down and give it to the robot, uh, but they have, there's some connection between uh, their value function and their actions. And the robot doesn't know what it is, but its objective is, as I said before, to maximize the human value function. So when you write down simple instances of this game, uh, then you can solve it mathematically, and you can look at how the systems behave uh, as they play this game. And uh, as you would hope, some nice things happen. So the robot now uh, has an incentive to ask questions first, so it doesn't just uh, do whatever it thinks is best. It can ask, you know, is this a good idea? Uh, it can ask, you know, wh which of these two things might I do? Uh, and the human now has an incentive to teach the robot, because by teaching the robot, the robot will become more useful. Uh, and so the behavior of, of both uh, parties is, is considerably changed by being uh, in this game. So I want to look at one particular instance of this game, which we call the off-switch problem. And the off-switch problem arises because, uh, based on the argument of instrumental goals, the idea that uh, you can't fetch the coffee if you're dead, uh, any attempt to switch off a robot uh, is going to result in uh, countermeasures by the robot. Um, and this seems like a problem that's almost uh, unavoidable. Right? We said, you know, for pretty much any objective, it's very hard to think of an objective uh, that you can carry out better after you're dead than before it. Um, 
And so uh, this is a fundamental problem, and Turing's assumption that we could just switch off uh, the superintelligent machine is kind of like saying, well, you know, if you're worried about losing the game of chess, you can just beat Deep Blue, just play better moves, right? It's not as easy as that. Um, but there is an answer, which is that the robot uh, should not be given a specific objective. We want the robot to be humble in the sense the robot should know that it does not know the true objective. And then its single-minded pursuit of the objective and, and its uh, self-defense against any interference uh, will actually evaporate. So if, um, if the human is going to switch off the robot, why would it do that? The reason is that the robot is doing something that the human doesn't like. The robot, of course, thinks that what it's doing is what the human likes, but it acknowledges that there's a possibility that it's wrong. And so if the human is going to switch the robot off, the robot learns in some sense from being switched off that what it was doing was undesirable and therefore being switched off is better for its objective, which is to optimize the human value function. And so now the robot actually has a positive incentive uh, to allow itself to be switched off. It does not have a positive incentive to switch itself off, so it won't commit suicide, uh, but it will allow the human to switch it off. And this is a very straightforward analog of the theorem of the non-negative expected value of information. That in some sense, the, the human's action of switching it off is a form of information, uh, and the robot welcomes that uh, if it happens. So this leads actually to um, a, sort of a rethinking a little bit of, of how we go about doing AI, that, that uncertainty in objectives turns out to be quite important. And um, it's been ignored, even though uncertainty in all kinds of other parts of AI has been uh, studied intensively since the early 80s, uh, uncertainty in the objectives has been almost completely ignored. But one reason is that uh, in the standard formulation of decision problems, Markov decision processes and so on, uncertainty in objectives is actually provably irrelevant uh, because you're trying to optimize an expected reward and if there's uncertainty over the reward, then uh, you can simply integrate over the uncertainty uh, and your behavior will be exactly the same as if you knew the expected value of that reward. Uh, but that theorem only holds if the environment contains no information about the reward. So as soon as the environment can provide more information, then that theorem is invalid. Uh, and clearly, uh, if what you care about is the human value function and the human is in your environment and the human can act, then those actions provide information about the reward function. Uh, similarly, the, the human, well, one particular kind of action is the provision of reward signals. So reinforcement learning can occur uh, by humans providing reward signals. Now, let's go and look at a little bit of uh, a little bit of history of reward signals. Uh, and uh, so here, here are some well-known experiments on, on uh, what's called wire heading. So a rat uh, will actually sort of circumvent its normal uh, behavior and will actually starve itself to death if you give the ability uh, to the rat to basically provide reward signals directly, uh, either by chemicals or by electrical stimulation. Uh, even though it's starving to death, it will do that instead of eating. Uh, so, and a human actually will behave the same way. These are some very interesting experiments from the 1950s. So uh, in any real situation, unlike the mathematical model of reinforcement learning where the reward signal is provided exogenously, sort of as it were, by God, uh, in the real world, someone has to provide the reward signal. You, if you're providing the reward signal, are part of the environment. And the reinforcement learning agent will hijack the reward generating mechanism. And if that's you, then it will hijack you. Uh, and force you to provide uh, maximal rewards. Uh, but this actually just results from a mistake. The math, and, and it's, it's interesting that by looking at it from this different perspective, from the perspective of, of cooperative inverse reinforcement learning, we realize that the standard formulation of reinforcement learning is just wrong. The signal given to the agent is not a reward. It is information about the reward. And you just change the mathematical formulation to have that definition instead. And then the hijacking becomes completely pointless because if you hijack uh, something that's providing information, all you do is get less information. You don't get more reward, you get less information. And so we can avoid wire heading by reformulating RL to have a information-based rather than reward-based uh, signal. So that leads 
to uh, a general approach that we're taking within the center that when we define a formal problem, what we are going to do is build agents that are designed mathematically to solve that problem. And then we want to understand, do those agents behave in ways that make us happy? So we are not trying to solve the problem that someone else is building a, uh, an AGI, some generally intelligent agent, and then we are going to somehow defend against it. Right? That's not the right way to think. The right way to think is to find a formal problem, build agents that, that solve it. And they can solve it arbitrarily well. They can be arbitrarily brilliant, but they are solvers of that problem F. And then show that the human will benefit from having uh, such, a, such a machine. Okay, so this is a difficult problem. There is a lot of information about uh, human behavior in our history. Everything we write down is, is a record of human behavior. So there's a massive amount of data that we're not really using uh, that can be used to learn about uh, what the human value system is. So that's good. There's also a strong economic incentive. So as Google found out, for example, if you, if you write down your value function and say that the costs of misclassification are of one type of object as another, uh, are all equal for every type of object and everything you could misclassify it as, that value function is wrong and then you lose a lot of, uh, a lot of reputation as a result. Uh, you can also imagine that uh, you know, a few years down the road, uh, mistakes in understanding the human value function will cause uh, a very significant backlash against uh, in the industry that produced that mistake. And so there's a very strong incentive to get this value system right. Uh, even before we reach the, the stage of having superhuman AI. Um, there are some reasons for pessimism, which I always translate into reasons for working hard. Uh, and that is that humans are very complicated. They are not optimizers. They are very complicated systems, and there are lots of them, and they're all different. Uh, and some of them you don't really want to learn from, and so on. These are problems where we need social science to help us, and it makes things much more difficult, but also much more interesting. So, uh, I recommend that we work on practical projects, that we don't simply speculate about what AGIs might be like uh, and, and, and write sort of interesting but ultimately uh, uh, not implementable ideas about how we might control them, that we actually look at practical projects on real systems. So I think within our center, we'll probably be looking at intelligent personal assistants. Other people might look at things like smart homes, where uh, clearly there are things that could go wrong uh, and there are, there are incentives to get this uh, right uh, early on. It would be nice to have simulation environments where, in fact, real simulated disasters could happen uh, so that we can get more of a sense. Uh, this will be an, uh, sort of a, uh, a generator of ideas about what can go wrong and then how we might uh, try to address it. So I think uh, Jan is getting uh, impatient. Uh, so we're at really aiming at a change in the way that AI defines itself. So we, we shouldn't be talking about safe AI or beneficial AI any more than a civil engineer talks about uh, building bridges that don't fall down. It's just part of the definition of a bridge that it doesn't fall down. It, it should be part of the definition of AI that it's beneficial, that it's safe. Uh, and this, this is not uh, a separate AI safety community that's nagging the real AI community. This should be what the AI community does intrinsically in its day-to-day -day business. Um, we want social scientists to be involved. Uh, we would like to understand a lot more about the actual human value system because it really matters. We're not building AI to benefit bacteria. We're building AI to benefit us. Um, and uh, hopefully it'll make us better people, that we'll learn a lot more about what our value systems are or could be. Um, and by making that a bit more explicit, uh, it'll be easier for us uh, to be good so to speak. So Wiener, going back to his paper from 1960 and going back to the slightly more gloomy color of the earlier part of the talk, uh, he pointed out that this is incredibly difficult to do, but we don't have a choice, right? We can't just say, oh, this is too far off in the future. Uh, it's too difficult to make any predictions. We have to you know, just continue as if nothing was going to happen. Uh, the problem is bigger uh, and more difficult, uh, but that still doesn't mean we should ignore it. Thank you. Thanks. I, that was very interesting. I, I particularly liked your um, formulation of the problem as a, as a two-player cooperative game and addressing the, the question about switching off AI, possibly. I don't think I understood it entirely, though. How is that particular choice by humans different than other choices? If you say, I want to move the bishop here, I want to push the throttle forward, I want to drive 
off the bridge. I want to take the red pill. How does the AI know, oh, this is one where I let the human overrule, and this other one, maybe I shouldn't let the human uh, decide? Is there a distinction between that choice and other choices? if you're uncertain. Yeah, there is. I mean, I think, uh, and it also depends on your, on your model of the human. So if, if you have a self-driving car, uh, it has an off switch. Um, but if a self-driving car is transporting a you know, two-year-old, you, you may want to disable the off switch. In fact, that's the right thing to do. So uh, you can calculate the expected value to the human of, uh, of having an off switch that's, that they, uh, <laughs> no, sometimes, yeah, sometimes the off switch should be disabled. Uh, so so the, whole, the whole evaluation is to look at the, the value of the human plus the robot system. Is, that, is the human better off with the robot uh, or better off not with the robot? And we only want robots where the human is provably better off. And sometimes that means the robot shouldn't allow itself to be switched off. So, you know, a robot um, uh, anesthesiologist that's keeping you alive while you're unconscious Right, is not relying on any of the decisions that you're making, right? And you want to you want to trust it uh, completely while you're unconscious. So uh, it depends on the circumstance. But the off switch problem, right, is that Turing originally proposed is a an intelligent human who thinks they can switch off the machine, but turns out they can't. One more question, uh, Andy. Um, Andy McAfee, MIT. This is a non-off switch question. Um, you brought up the great example of nuclear power as a case where maybe under discussion of risks got the field into trouble. The next example in your slide was GMOs, which seems like a really interesting case in exactly the opposite direction, where the scientific consensus about safety there is at least as strong as the consensus for uh, human, human caused global warming. And yet a lot of that, that technology is not diffusing and a lot of people are made much worse off because of over uh, emphasis on the risks. Could you comment on uh, why you added GMOs to that slide and what you conclude from it? Yeah, I, I, I thought I, I thought through this um, this case and partly. So, I, in fact, the uh, the prime minister's office in the UK asked me to go talk to them because they were worried that AI might be subject to the same uh, negative outcome that happened with with GMOs in Europe. Um, I I personally don't think there's any real danger of that. I mean, the, uh, the level of investment and the, uh, the acceleration of investment in AI is, is enormous. Uh, and it's also, it's, it's a different type of thing. Uh, it's very hard to ban uh, AI, which is really people writing formulas on whiteboards. It's not, it's not a particular organism or, uh, or a particular chemical that you can put on the field or not put on the field. Um, but I think, what happened with GMOs is that um, the industry went into a defensive mode where they would deny any and all possible risks. And uh, so it, it ended up not being, a, not being seen as uh, an honest uh, discussion that was going on. It was very much uh, the industry versus uh, the people who had doubts or questions uh, were trashed. Um, people, were, the industry was funding uh, other, you know, other people outside, uh, uh, supposedly outside to write negative articles smearing the people who were doing the research that might raise questions about GMOs. So it was a, they, they adopted the classic techniques that, for example, the tobacco industry adopted. Uh, and I think that resulted in skepticism. But they, right, but it was the techniques that they adopted in the, in the discussion, right, to, to deny risk, to say that all these questions are answered, trust us, we know, when in fact there were things they didn't know. And it's, it turned out that, uh, that some of the, the negative effects people predicted haven't come to pass, but it wasn't that they had already done all the science, uh, they just simply denied that anything could possibly go wrong. So I, I think that it was more of a political failure and the political failure was, was not that they were, they were right and everyone else was stupid, it's that they adopted this approach that everyone else was stupid uh, and that they were right, and that didn't work. Uh, 